Welcome back. You're watching Metropole Television. This is your economic review. My name is Simba Elijah Charles. Can I get, let me take this time to introduce to the conversation for the very first time this morning, Gabriel Mwendwa. Gabriel, good morning, sir. Good morning, Simba. How are you doing? Amazing, man. Happy to have you around. Let's pop you into the conversation. Now, proposed, change, proposed changes, yes, uh, to the law might see the monthly contributions to the National Hospital Insurance Fund, NHI, reviewed every five years if adopted by the National House. Now, the proposals included in the new NHI bill will spell deeper financial strain on employers and workers as the bill also proposes mandatory contributions to Kenyans above the age of 18 years. Now, the rates were last reviewed in April 2015 and is now seeking to increase its income to boost cover for diseases like cancer and offer health insurance to all Kenyans that saw monthly contributions for the former workers increased from 350 shillings to a graduated scale of 1,700 shillings based on pay with informal workers contributing 500 shillings from 350 shillings. Now the changes will make the state of backed scheme one of the richest insurers in the country with an annual collection of close to 100 billion shillings given its receipts over 60 billion shillings in the year ended a June 20. 20. Wow, that's a lot of money. All right, let's look at exactly where we are in terms of those NHIF contributions trend that have pushed us to around 60 billion in the year ended to June. So you can actually see in the year ended 2018-2019, we closed at 58B and then we came in and we then and then we came in and closed at a 60B in the year ended in June 2020. 20. 2020. Now that's exactly where we are. All right, let's talk about exactly how the government has been spending on our health in the country. And you can see from 2015 to 2019, it has been on a graduated trend 34, 56, 61, 76. Now we're talking about 115 in 2019, 2020. So I'm showing you this government is not joking about that universal health care in the country they wanted to tick. But then, Gabriel, question being, if indeed everybody is going to be on that cover, because this bill is saying that if you're above 18 years, then you should be paying 6,000 shillings a year. Should they review it after every five years? Because we know the last time they reviewed this was six years ago. Yeah, uh, Simba, so two things. One, I think um, in terms of reviewing every five years, that, that, that's really okay. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, it will be reviewed upwards or in any direction. It's just a review. We, we have no problem with that. I think uh, the bone of contention is with, uh, you know, the idea of uh, charging everyone. Yes. And unfortunately, charging those who they can actually reach, uh, which is only their formal employees yes. you know way more than they, they, they would charge anyone else so the increase in that cost you know for formal employees is going to be unfortunately higher than most employers would like to absorb when we are going through this uh, hardship at the moment and what is unfortunate simba is that uh, you and i are very clear the costs. they have clearly put up the costs but if you look at the benefits they are providing they have actually not gone into detail as an insurance company who should. You should be selling more on the benefits you will be providing yes. so that people don't have a problem paying the cost. Yes. But you and I this morning cannot even canvas the benefits that in, in detail. In fact, they're trying to reduce uh, the, the costs of, uh, or, or the claims they get. So you're trying to collect more from the same people, but somehow you're trying to pay. Yes, I think we seem to have a lot. You cannot but Yes, Gabriel, can, can you, you confirm? Me, you can get me, sir. Yeah, I can hear you. Can Fantastic. Hear you well. Let's continue. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that uh, charge Gabriel uh, too much or uh, too heavily uh, and then use that funds to cover 
another five, ten people. So if one person is paying for another nine people, yes. then you're going to run into the problems they are running into now. Over to you, Simba. Ah, fantastic. We, we seem to be on and off with you, Gabriel, but you're quite clear. Hopefully, we get that um, recovered as we go on with this conversation. Now, Gabriel, just before I cross over to Arnold again this morning, there's a very interesting statistic that is coming out of NHRF. Because now, let's look at exactly what they're saying. They're saying that if you look towards the end of the last month, but then out of the ones who are on that NHIF cover and are active in terms of contributions, they're saying 5.7 million. Now, let's listen to that, Gabriel. It's, it's a big statistic. They're saying 5.7 million Kenyans, approximately, Gabriel, 54% of the 8 million Kenyans who are on NHIF stopped their contributions. Now, out of this 8.8 .8 million, we do know that 4.45 million are from the formal sector. Now, from the formal sector, we do know it is a statutory contribution. That's fine. So let's assume that more than 50% of this from the formal sector are actually paying their contributions. But 54% of the ones who pay less stopped making their contributions, actually even after getting treatments from this cover. Is that something that this bill is trying to address? And do you think making it mandatory for any Kenyan above 18 years will start to address this issue of Kenyans not contributing when they should actually contribute? Uh, I don't think it will, Simba, because you cannot... What are you going to do? Are you going to imprison people because they're not... <laughs> In right now, you are simply not going to treat... you when you go to the hospital or a pay and stuff it's really unnecessary yes what they should have been thinking to address as i've clearly stated is that uh important product for people to actually come to what that is how insurance works that is how insurance competes and that is as simple as that. Yes. And the problems they're trying to address, which are actually very okay, uh, trying to ensure everyone can access health cover because, you know, accidents and cancer. If you're going to bully people in, that's someone who's still dependent. That is someone who still even has a health bill. No, they're still paying help. They're either in university, they have no income. 500 is a lot of shilling, is a lot of money for them. Yes. So then you cannot ask them to pay all this monthly. Yeah, they really need to come up with a better strategy on how to ensure that Kenyans are covered. One, without burdening people who actually have no income. Two, without burdening those who have income and cannot escape these costs unnecessarily because eventually people will start getting creative on how to avoid it if you continue burdening those who are in the formal employment simply because they cannot run away to cover for you like i said one person paying post nine well then it's, it's not going to work yes pretty much let me cross over to annals uh, this morning as well annals there's that that Gabriel is mentioning there. Is that what, what were you going to do if I don't contribute? Yeah, you're making it mandatory for me to contribute. But what if I don't contribute? Are you going to imprison me? What are you going to do? Is that what a bottleneck is to this bill? It, figuring out the people who have to pay because they're saying anybody who's above 18 years has to pay. But how are they going to make sure that they pay are they going to say, well, you cannot even get treatment anywhere else if you're not an active contributor? Is that what we're looking at? And, and, and all that a time when even KRA is smiling to reducing the NEO, um, the NEO filing for taxes to just two. Yeah, I think that moves to reflect the economy. Uh, unfortunately, from what it, uh, the, these changes are being introduced at the wrong time. Yes. I think 
prudent cost if you want uh, advice to government or treasury some of the when uh, economy is coming very well uh gdp is good average income per household is good no that's when you would it would be prudent or to, it would make sense to uh, to do, introduce such moves yes uh the nhf 2021 bill has brought a lot of uh, conversations in the marketplace uh and one of the most uh important uh feedback has come from uh, the association of kenyan insurance who have raised some very serious concerns number one um you do realize apart from nhif most entities most uh, employers actually uh supplement that cover with private covers yes and one of the concerns which has been brought by aki is that this would probably uh force employers to now reduce on uh giving them supplementing what they are covering their employees with these private covers just to try and comply with the government that's number one and then number two uh another concern which has been brought uh has been to do with the cost which would be brought so for example if 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 I'm, I'm running an organization and probably apart from the nhif which i normally pay for my employees i've actually maybe got into a contractual obligation with uh, another insurance company just to try and cover my employees so the thing is if i'm on I'm to comply with the government and also uh, continue covering my employees it will bring, it will put my cost it will take my costs higher so if you look at those dynamics uh to the employers and also what gabriel has mentioned to the small uh bracket of uh, formerly employed individuals it simply means that the cost is going higher yes it's the cost of uh your your your, your taxes payable your uh, deductions uh have gone higher your purchasing power has gone lower so it's it's a very awkward situation and i think the proposition would make sense maybe just to allude to what gabriel has said it would make sense based on the benefits the inherent benefits which would come with uh the extra payments which you are making to nhif yes so from where i see it it's it's a it's a it's, a, it's an awkward situation uh honestly speaking and it would only make sense if the benefits uh match whatever we are paying for yes. unfortunately with government backed uh, solutions if you go to the ground uh the situation in most cases the pay does not meet, does not meet uh, what you're getting, the value. Yes. The value, in most cases, has a mismatch with what you're paying for. So it's a tricky situation. Unfortunately, the government is really pushing it. But I feel, economically speaking, it's at the wrong time. Pretty much. Uh, Gabriel, just as we clear on uh, this specific uh, topic, so if indeed employers are going to match this contribution again to NHIF. And then we're saying that, well, somebody has to contribute around 500 shillings. Are we spelling doom to the insurance sector in the country? Because now you'll be looking at it and saying, why would I have an insurer to come in and insure me instead of me going the government way? Because if it's mandatory from the government side, it's, it looks like SIBA have to then say no to the insurers coming in and then going to NHIF. Yes, we seem to be having again that difficulty um, to connect. No, I'm here, Simba. Sorry. Uh, yes. Sorry, Simba. Uh, just, yes, just to take that question. Um, uh, I think, um, like we said, we do not understand the benefits. That's yes. really the problem. Yes. You know, what benefits are there so that I can pair with my existing in private insurance and then make that decision? What do I go for NHIF? Do I downscale the kind of product I have with my private insurance? But because we do not understand that, I assure you, no one is going to drop their private insurance while relying on NHIF. It's yes. not going to it's not going to happen. So the insurance sector is actually not going to be affected. If anything, NHIF will actually pay for more claims and will cover more things, which means uh, private insurances will have lower claims and more profitability. That's how ideally it should play out. Yes. But still a lot of information gaps on uh, the benefits so that we can make that decision. Pretty much. Now, gentlemen, let's move into the last issue this morning, where the National Treasury and the Planning Cabinet Secretary, Okuri Tanning, has warned that the country's full recovery is not assured. 
Due to the uncertainty around the COVID-19 virus, delays in vaccination programs, increasing debt levels and rising inflationary pressures. As Treasury launches the financial year 2022-2023 and a medium-term budget preparation process, the ministry is demanding sector working groups to prioritize implementation of key development projects to sustain the country's ballooning debt. This is as the country is headed to a general election in under one year, even as the economic recovery still hangs in the balance as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to ravage the country. Now, with a slow pace in inoculation processes, emergence of variants and the country's inability to tame the spread of the virus, increasing debt levels and rising inflationary pressures, the country still has a long way to go, according to the CS. Ah, all right, let's look at that data then. How is the government, how has the government been um, spending? And we're going to start on that recurrent expenditure. And we're going to have it all the way up to 2019, 2020. Sorry, actually 2020, 2021, I believe. That's when we had a drop in that. But then the conversation is on a development expenditure where it has been dropping again. Is that we we go back again to 2015, 2016 levels in a 2020, 2021 budget document. Gabriel, let me start with you again before I bring in Arnold. If we know that the economy is not going to perform again, I mean that's as this, that's the attorney saying is is quite uncertain about the performance of the economy in a 2020 in 2022. 2023 and even actually 2021 and 2022 is there something that the office can do in the final budget making process to spur anything at all in a 2022 because 2021 then is pretty much done yes gabriel can you get me Yes, I can get you. Oh, sorry. Uh, somehow I again thought you were speaking to Arnold. Oh, my apologies about that. Okay. <laughs> it's you, Gabriel. So, yes. uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, your question is uh, pretty clear and the answer is in there. It's not going to happen. They're not yes. going to spur this economy, whether it's through that budget uh, or whatever plans they'd actually laid down before. And, you know, this excuse that, uh, you know, population is not inoculated is really not neither here nor there. Yes. So let me explain it to you. I mean... What do you mean spy an economy? You know, you, you don't spy an economy through, you know, the budget. Yes. You know, it's really not worked for the, the this government for very long, whether it's Jubilee or whatever government is in place now. You know, they're not, they've not really been able to spy the economy through their massive expenditure. Yes. Because what happens is they're spending on projects which do not come down to the economy. They really spy a few industries, a few, very few manufacturing industries linked to infrastructure. And that is the end of it. There is there is nothing else uh, beyond that, yeah. And that's really the problem. So, what is going to happen 2021, 2022? We're just going to go to elections. It's going to be the same scenario as this year. If there's anything genius they were going to do, they yes. would have done it in this budget, not the next one. Let's attack that question with Arnold as well. I'll be coming back to Gabriel on that because then, even as he speaks that, we do know Kenya has forfeited. It's debt renegotiation plans with China and old, and then the CS comes and tells you we're quite uncertain about the way the economy is going to perform. In fact, because of also that increasing debt, that's why we can't put it somewhere in the way that we're going to perform this year or the year after this year. How do we put that together, Arnold, coming from the same office? Now, uh, now I think, I think it's, it's interesting how such sentiments, I think whatever sentiments have come in from Ukuriatani are actually the true sentiments in terms of where the economy is going. If you look at month-on-month uh, -month inflation since January, inflation has been going up. Yes. And uh, when, when the year started, uh, uh, there was a hope that trigger rebound. Forth. But of course, that has not because of one, and things are not looking up. Uh, several things at the beginning. The country 
possible to negotiate uh, foreign debt with various uh, debtors, including the Paris Club, including uh, China. And unfortunately, most of our Chinese debt is uh, is not concessional debt. It's actually commercial debt from Chinese bank, the like of the likes of Chinese, uh, the Exim Bank of China. And uh, if you look at what's happening, probably the reason as to why uh, Treasury CS has come up with those sentiments is because of what has happened when Kenya was trying to push for further, uh, for further concessions, further moratoriums. Uh, those commercial banks reached a point whereby they felt that they could not more con give concessions in general. Then the government was trying to push for more concessions. Stop disbursing uh funds for infrastructural projects which some of which are quote unquote legacy projects even as this government out so in the wake of that yes. i feel that that's probably one of the reasons why the cs came out and said you know what we could we were probably not gonna be uh in the economy again if you look at the general performance of the economy we, we are always in a funny situation because if you look at what what normally appears in the budget uh, particularly where uh, revenue is supposed to be generated from, from KRA, from, from taxation. We find ourselves in a situation whereby we need to generate revenue uh, uh, for government at the same time to generate revenue. So that normally leaves us in a situation whereby we're increasing our taxes, we're negatively affecting businesses, and that ad has adverse effects on the economy. So if you're never negatively affecting businesses, it means probably some of the institutions in your economy are cutting down on their labor force, which means you're cutting down on your PAE, which again means you're cutting down on revenue which you would have made, which you would have made from the PAE. So it's, 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 it's essentially a, a domino effect, a series of events which is normally affected from very key uh, decisions which the government makes. Yes. So for us to get out of this rut, uh, we have to come up with sustainable ways of maybe running how we tax, managing our external and internal debt. These are basics which we need as a country to find ways of managing so that we could come, uh, we, we could have the economy recover. Yes. If you look at debt, what, uh, like the disbursements which have been made by the World Bank, the transfers of disbursements which have been made by the World Bank in the year 2021, they've come with a raft of uh, austerity measures, which is very common as far as well, the World Bank is concerned. Now, when you when you have austerity measures, it simply means you have to cut down on your spending. Now, when you cut down on your spending, that again affects your economy. So, <laughs> we it's a it's, it's it's a delicate juggling act. However, uh, it simply means we have to be more creative as far as national uh, economics is concerned and yes. national policy is concerned. Yes. We have to find ways of getting more concessions. Uh, pushing these concessions to the marketplace, which would spur uh, economic growth through uh, 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 less less costing as far as uh, uh, businesses are concerned, and and basically just enabling people to have more purchasing power. Yes, All right, Gabriel, clear for us this conversation. I want to put you on the spot this morning because you sound like a man who's thrown in the towel especially for that office chances of really having something they could do in the final year. Gabriel, what can they do? If you were asked that question, what could be your focus? And your answer cannot be, well, I will do nothing, Gabriel. Okay, thank you very much for that, Simba. Uh, I think one the reason I was throwing the dial is and our worst decisions have been made during election years as far as the budgeting process goes. So yes. uh, that's why the expectations are very low. Now, what would I do? Uh, one, I would really be looking to uh, target a few sectors through the finance bill. Yes. Uh, so whatever bill that now they are making, uh, I would focus on that finance bill because we're talking about a short-term solution. So through that finance bill, I'd look to help the very sectors that have been affected. We're talking hospitality, we're talking education, uh, and then we're talking some service sectors. Try and put more money in the people's pockets. Yes. I would cut back on development by uh, a third. I would uh, only finish the projects that are ongoing. I would not uh, start any other. And I would channel that money uh, to those sectors that have been affected, whether it's by uh, you know increasing the support for education. We've seen so many people asking for bursaries, et cetera. 
you know, just help the people get through this, uh, the, through the social challenges uh, they face. So cut the development budget by a third, channel it to more immediate needs uh, at this point in time. That's what I'll do. And then through the finance bill, uh, give more incentives to the most affected sectors. That's what I'll do, Sim. Pretty much. So hopefully they're listening this morning because Ukuri Yatani is actually calling for those sector proposals. Gabriel, I think you should try and find a way to one of those committees and see whether your document can actually make it your way to the final implementation. We will try. <laughs> Fantastic. I will say thank you very much to Arnold and Gabriel this morning for making time to speak to us here at Metropole Television. You gentlemen, you've been quite invaluable this morning. And that's exactly how we come to the end of the economic review this morning. Remember, you can take them online at Metropole TV, KE, across all your social media platforms. I am at Kia Gessimba. Good morning.